You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. Any quiffy bits? Nope. All right, cool. Today we're going to be talking about the second serial of the 25th season of Doctor Who, The Happiness Patrol, which consists of three episodes that aired from November 2nd, 1988 to November 16th, 1988. True facts! And I want to give a special shout out to Bisexual Brigadier for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks Bisexual Brigadier. You can check her out at bisexualbrigadier.tumblr.com. Uh, and I also want to give a special shout out to our newest Patreon patron, Bill Lamond. Hey, thank you, Bill. You can check him out on Twitter at pastshelfdatejr. He also uh, quite frequently sends us emails telling us what he thought of our episodes. He's a very cool dude. Nice. Hi, Bill. And I uh, also want to say hello to our two guests today. We have returning Vincent T.L. Bless me, Watchathon, for I have sinned. It's been months now since my last pod session. I have not been catching up on classic Doctor Who, nor keeping up with the podcast or uh, any podcast. I fear I may have strayed too far from pod. Um, just That's, s- that say... feels like it really threw you. Yeah, just say three Hail Sarah Janes and you're good. I don't know how it goes, but I'll improvise. <laughs> That's a Catholic thing, right? You say yeah. Hail Marys or whatever? It just gets rid of your sins. You're gone now. Also, Adam uh, Clegg is here as well. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quite follow that intro. But I would literally like to say I am actually wearing my Happiness Patrol t-shirt for this, um, this recording. I, I've come fully prepared. Happiness will prevail. So how are y'all doing? What's been going on with y'all? Whoever wants to start first can go find it out. It's obviously Christmas and New Year, so it's been that slightly weird thing of not knowing what day of the week it is for quite a while, and just trying to eat all the leftover food and drink all the booze that we bought. So uh, yeah, I'm still in that slight confusion. Nice. Vince? I'm just, uh, you know, podcasting, living in the moment. (laughs) (laughs) I've been up to nothing. Pretty much sinking into headaches and depressions and things like that, like we we all do sometimes. Especially in these pandemic times. Also, while you're just waiting for time to start again. We're all on pause, which is nice and also weird. Uh, I actually have some news. I'm starting a new job. Right. That, that, that is exciting. I'm starting in a week. I'm going to be writing for Looper dot com various pop culture articles and whatnot and i'm going to be writing for a living hey full time congratulations and good luck Woo. i mean the job's not full time but i'll be writing <laughs> you have you have other i have other free re- freelance writing gigs i'm gonna be doing the dream i guess we'll see how that goes but for now doctor who i don't have titles i don't have i don't have pretty much any notes at all this time uh because i couldn't be bothered I used to have notes and come up with titles and things, but I got really fucking lazy around the time when I stopped watching. <laughs> I've jumped ahead for this one. Yeah, you le- you left off uh, sometime in The Fourth Doctor, right? Yep. I'm still in the Tom Baker era. I'm stuck there, and nobody has uh, come and rescued me. I-, I seem to be trapped in time. You need Tom Baker to come and pull you out. Yeah, or or uh, any anyone with, with a time machine. Uh, I'll take Reg. Bill and Ted? Doc, Doc Brown. The Bill and Ted would do. You know, basically anyone. Skullman. Those guys from Primer? I haven't seen Primer. I saw Looper. They had time travel. Probably not one of those people. That would not be ideal because either they would shoot me or expect me to shoot them or something. I don't know. So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm hoping not one of those one of those guys, but other than that, pretty much anyone. I mean, maybe not the Terminator. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna know on a Terminator. Any any time traveler whose purpose is to kill or be killed. 
Yeah, th- those I'd rather not be the one to. But at this point, you know, it's I'm you know beggars can't be choosers. I I I don't remember what we're talking about now. Oh right, the Happiness Patrol. Let's dive into the Happiness Patrol episode one: A Dew Sprinkled Sunrise. So we start off very noir esque. There is a sad woman who is approached by a guy in like a trench coat. Is he in a trench coat? I think he's in a trench coat. Yes, yeah, he is. He had trench coat vibes. He definitely looks mysterious. He says he knows of a place where all the sad people can go and uh, gives her a card. Uh, has his name on it, Silas P. And he's like, yeah, but flip it over. And then she flips it over and it's... I was gonna say, it's his Twitter handle on the other side. That's where all the sad people go. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate. At Silas underscore P83. She flips it over and it says that uh, he works undercover for the Happiness Patrol. He points a gun at her and says, time to get really depressed. And then a whole bunch of the Happiness Patrol show up and they're all very bright pink and colorful. And uh, I appreciate that because I currently have pink hair. It's like this episode was made for me. Except I guess I'm the bad guys? Yeah. Yeah, you are the, the tool of a fascist regime. Sounds right. You're the ones who are complaining that they don't get cooler guns. I mean, it's true. If you're going to have guns, they should look neat. Ace and the Doctor arrive on this planet and are just having a chat about dinosaurs, dropping some references to Invasion of the Dinosaurs, because the Doctor says the Brig met one of these dinosaurs. I forget which one. I, I believe multiple Tyrannosaurus is Tyrannosauri? Sure. Or Pterodactyls, too, were also mentioned. Shout out to the Princess and the Pterodactyls. By J.B. Hivemind. Available on Amazon or where other books are sold. But probably just Amazon. I thought it was Hivamind. Well, that reminds me. Road Trippy is in my public library. So if you're in Georgia, you can check out Road Trippy from a library. Yeah, actually, if you're in Georgia at all because of the way that uh, Pines works. Yeah, so... You can request that shit. (laughs) Yeah, people in Georgia, check out Road Trippy. It's good, and I had nothing to do with it. That's not true. You helped edit it. A little bit. You you said, this shit doesn't make sense. Fix it. And then we tried to fix it. Did I? Occasionally. I think it was mostly just grammar stuff. Yeah. But they talk about how they like dinosaurs, but they don't like uh, elevator music, which is piped throughout this whole city. And I learned something while researching this episode. I put Muzak originally in my notes, but apparently that's a very specific company. It is, but they they do name it in the third part, I think. But yes, it is a company. Yeah, they. I think that this episode they mostly just call it Lift Music. Um, but yeah, I think Muzak is maybe specifically American. I'm not sure. The, the harmonica player calls it Muzak, I think. And he's American, so that checks out. And we also learned that the doctor has come to check this place out because there's stuff going on, which is a continuation of... I, I know you don't know this, Vince, but it's a continuation <laughs> from last serial of the doctor less showing up and stuff happening and more the doctor showing up because stuff is happening or he is specifically seeking stuff out. McCoy is arguably the most proactive of the classic doctors. You know, he very much... He doesn't always have a plan, but he very much seeks out trouble. They did seem pretty keen on getting arrested. That's that's the first step. Is that a recurring thing? No, I don't, or at least I don't. I mean, maybe it starts here, but <laughs> <laughs> not unless it happens again. I, th- I think it's it's more they just know the basic rules of a Doctor Who episode, and that if they if they want to find anything out, they have to get arrested. So they're like, if we just skip to this bit, yeah, <laughs> get the get it out of the way early. I think what's really interesting is that we've talked a lot about, like, 13 being a cop. Yeah. And that it seems like she shows up places because things are going wrong, and that's to its detriment, because she feels like she's just there to, like, enforce rules. Yeah. Or, like, her version of morality. Whereas, like, I have no problem with it here whatsoever. I feel like there's a lot of things that Seven does that's present in 13 that bother me, that totally work in this season and in this era, which is a little fascinating to me. I mean, and... Part of it is that, like, they show up specifically, like, topple the government and leave. Yes. It's not, we're going to set things right and good and hold them. It's more dangerous. I think I think that one of the reasons this is obviously one of my very favourite eras of Who is it's, particularly once Ace joins, is it basically becomes about two anarchists travelling around blowing stuff up. And I think that's that's wonderful. But yeah, like the Seventh Doctor isn't interested in fair play. He's very much just like, oh, this is bad. I am going to bring it crashing down now. I'm just going to cause a little bit of chaos and uh, go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with these patterns because I, I don't, I, I'm not keeping up with... <laughs> 
with the show. Well, really, it's just it's kind of just starting since the excuse me since the okay? last one. I got a hiccup. I I, I, f- I feel like I have a, a basic grasp of who of who Ace is because Ace is very much archetypal. Like it's 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 very easy to get a read on Ace. Just the jacket alone says pretty much everything <laughs> you need to know about Ace. <laughs> Definitely um, queer coded. <laughs> This episode in the, in general is is pretty. Um, there's some pretty gay subtext going on in this one. I mean, yeah, because we you talked about uh, Silas P at the beginning, and that I think is very reminiscent of undercover sting operations that we used against gay men. I mean, homosexuality was only came legal in Britain in uh, the late sixties. I can't quite think of the date, but there was still even after that there was still police operations against cottaging and and that sort of thing going on at the time. So yeah. It's very feels very deliberate. Um, speaking of metaphors and whatnot, we do see a scene of Silas P getting a badge for bagging forty five killjoys, as they are called. Though he says it's forty seven, but the woman giving him the badge is Helen A, who uh, is a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's she. I mean, she's brilliant, and I actually that that bit where he gets the badge is I love the dialogue throughout this story. But there's that one thing of he's like forty seven, and he's I'm aiming for the top, and she goes. Not quite the very top. <laughs> so for those not in the know, uh, this character is definitely uh, Margaret Thatcher, right? You don't say. Yeah, I think there's one bit, the one bit later where she she has a way of saying a line. Uh, Families are very important for people's happiness, and that the way she says it, that's the most Thatcher-esque moment. So about the the phrasing of it is say so Thatcher, but yeah, that, <laughs> but no one noticed. Like, literally in this country, it took 25 years, and then they reported on Newsnight referring to this story. I'm not kidding. It was like 25 years later. They went, was Dot 2 trying to bring down Thatcher? And it's like, but no one noticed at the time. 1988, no one cared. (laughs) 2013, they literally had it as a news story. But 1988, no one noticed. I think part of that may be... The popularity of this show. show. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very sadly. Colin Baker kind of. Not Colin Baker specifically, but that Eric, I feel like, maybe uh, drove people away. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, one, one the, oddly enough, what, one of the great advantages for the McCoy era is that no one at the BBC cares, and one of the great weaknesses is that no one at the BBC cares. So they can get away with all sorts of stuff, but when things are getting better, the program isn't getting promoted. You know, they're stuck up against Coronation Street, so they're just kind of left to wither away. But at the same time, they get, they get away, not just in this story, in others, with so much stuff that, that they probably couldn't do now. I don't think they could get away with half the stuff in the McCoy era now. Uh, it's like a, the good version of what happened uh, with Till Death, that show you watched. It is like the good version of that, or no one's paying attention, so... They just do whatever they want. Yeah. But with Till Death, it was like, we'll just do whatever because we don't care. And this is like, we'll do whatever and get away with stuff that we've been wanting to do. I always talk about Till Death because in their like last season, because you have to have, I think, four to be syndicated. Yeah, there's and, like, like a That's the only reason why they were still making the show. <laughs> they would like reverse their music cues or just do dumb, weird shit. And I found this out at like 3 a.m. working master control third shift. And, like, I heard music playing backwards, and I was like, what is wrong with my playlist? What is happening? And I, like, had to look it up. <laughs> to find out they were doing it on purpose. But they were doing it on purpose. And I was like, you really messed with my 3 a.m. third shift brain. Thank you. <laughs> like, oh, no, what's wrong? <laughs> I was reading about a show recently. I can't remember what it was called, but it had Rob I think it was Rob Lowe was playing a lawyer. And they cancelled it, it didn't get like a full season, but they had like four episodes left, which they had to complete for the DVD or something. So they just randomly decided in the last episode, turned out he's a serial killer. <laughs> so this little guy, guy confronts him. He goes, yeah, yeah, stabs him and then jumps off a building. <laughs> and they, 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 they Rob Lowe's a message like, yeah, we just did that because we were like, well, no one cares. That's, That's beautiful. amazing. It's kind of beautiful what, what people end up doing when no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that may be what started the the Westfall universe, too. So, so yeah, right. why not? <laughs> Who gives a shit? So the next thing that happens in this episode of Doctor Who is uh, the Doctor and Ace are, are wandering around the city and they bump into uh, a man who is collecting names. His name is Trevor Sigma, which the Doctor gets to say that, oh, hey, when I was in college, I, they called me Theta Sigma. And he gets very mad because he wants real names and not nicknames. Cause, Gross. <laughs> Because he asked for Ace's name and she says Ace and he's like, no nicknames. I don't know how he knows that's a nickname and not a real name. I don't know. And in fact, it's great because Ace insists that that is her real name. It is. Because it is. Yes. (laughs) Any chosen name is your real name. True. And this 
actor we've seen before. He was in... Oh, shit. Case of Androzani. Case of Androzani. Yes. He was the guy that, like, looked into the camera and... He, I don't know. He just talked to the camera occasionally. Do you remember that? He turned to the camera. Like, it was like he mi misread the stage direction or something and they just went with it. I don't remember that. It's supposed to be, like, an aside to himself, but he, like, looks into the camera and says it. It's very unnerving. I was going to say, I imagine and I then didn't he, like that. And then I don't he, like being acknowledged when I watch TV. It upsets me. And then he pushed a guy down an elevator shaft. But yeah, I didn't recognize him because he looks completely different. I think it's because he has a hat on. But uh, then we see the Happiness Patrol driving a really cool car that I don't know why they didn't use this really cool car in a later scene. I think they only had one really cool car and one mediocre car. Yeah, they have one big dune buggy and one go -kart. kind of shitty go-kart. Yes, <laughs> But right now they're in the really cool doom buggy and they uh, they find the TARDIS and then they just start painting it pink. And it looks great. It does. I kind of wish it stuck around being pink for a little while. It really suits it. And the doctor likes it too as well. He comes in and talks about how great it looks. They're like, you're not displeased by it? And he's like, no, it looks cool. But yeah, this is the scene where they're trying to get uh, to get arrested. And I think they get arrested for not having badges. Though there is like a, a joke about Ace like, I have badges, look. And then points to the badges on her jacket. Also, Ace at some point, I think like, she's like, why do you have these cheap guns or whatever? And then they fire the gun and it's like impressive. And then Ace says, Gordon Bennett. And I didn't know what the hell Gordon Bennett was. It's Goramit. Uh, that, is that like Cockney slang or something? What is what is Gordon Bennett? It's just one of those things that sounds similar. <laughs> It's just, uh, people did used to say it, like, it, but it was kind of fake swearing for kids. I remember in the 80s, people would say Gordon Bennett. Kids would say it sometimes. It's like gosh darn it. Yeah, gosh darn it. It's that kind of thing. It might, it probably does have a Cockney origin somewhere, but I, I, I'm not sure what, exactly what, what it would be. I'm going to Google it real quick. Gordon Bennett is an expression of incredulity, which alludes to the outrageous behavior of the American sportsman, publisher, and all-around hellraiser, James Gordon Bennett Jr., so it's a real person. Hmm. I figured it was just because it sounds like goddamn it. He was an enthusiastic and hedonist playboy. <laughs> Gordon Bennett. He apparently did a lot of like crazy sports stuff. A significant promoter and patron of sports, especially those requiring impressive and expensive equipment. For example, international motor racing, ballooning, and air racing. There's also the international Gordon Bennett balloon race, which still continues. It was in inaugurated by him in 1906. So I guess he was allowed fellow i don't know but yeah it's to cover up cursing got it cool i had no idea and it becomes a plot point <laughs> then we cut back to helen a who stops her husband joseph c from watching some television he's like this is a, a weird program it's called routine disappearance four hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred eighty seven. can i say i really love the fact that he's not joseph b because everyone in this society, you know, their position is, is determined by the alphabetical letter at the end of the name. That you never meet anyone who's got a B. This he's always got that gap. So he's Joseph. Her own husband is Joseph C, not not Joseph B. Like she always wants to keep a little bit of distance. I do love that. I'm wondering how many deaths do they do in this serial? Do they get to five hundred thousand? Because uh, it was definitely when he's watching the video, it's four hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred eighty seven. And the routine, dis the disappearance he's watching is the the woman from the beginning of the episode. So I wonder if they hit five hundred thousand. I might have to keep track as we as we recount this episode. Um, but anyway, they turn that off to watch her her broadcast where she says her catchphrase, which is. Happiness will prevail. Is there a happiness slogan in every season of Sylvester McCoy? Because last season had uh, build high for happiness. No, no, there isn't in. I, I not to spoil it for you, but there isn't in 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 next season. I'm afraid. But now you've said it, that is actually a really missed opportunity. Right. You just need one one serial every season that has brightly colored characters who talk about happiness. That's why it got canceled. They just forgot to do it and <laughs> ruined it. Then the Doctor and Ace are taken away to a, not to a prison, but to a waiting zone where they meet another Killjoy, Harold V, who used to be Harold's uh, higher up letter. Yeah. And he is playing slots. He wins and he gets a joke as a prize, which is uh, something along the lines of, what was this? Like, what happened to the Killjoy who won or something, and then uh, the the punchline is he was tickled to death. Not a very good joke. 
the doctor says it's not funny and who would have wrote, written something like that and harold says oh i wrote it he was the gag writer and then his brother went missing went to look for his brother and then they basically demoted him to a killjoy and are going to kill him at some point when uh the doctor asks well, if there are prisons if they're in a prison like they're in this waiting zone and he's assured that there are no prisons so he just starts to walk away and she's like but if you cross that line we will kill you and he does a nice little pirouette back but Harold starts just telling him a bunch of exposition about, like, there's executions, and he ta tells them about the Candy Man, and we briefly see the Candy Man, and he is literally... This is the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life, that's what he is. <laughs> it's super awesome. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so good. <laughs> it actually got this show in some legal trouble, because I don't know if... In America, you have Bertie Bassett. No, no, he was a he's a I don't know if he still is, but he was like a um a mascot for for licorice all sorts, and he was a, a like a character made of candy, uh, licorice all sorts. So he looked similar to the Candy Man. So when oh yeah, I can see just pulling up pictures, and I can see the similarity. So when Doctor Who was like, look, it's Bertie Bassett as a psychotic sociopathic killer, <laughs> Bassett were a bit like oh. Okay, and which is why when they eventually release like the Series 25 Blu-ray box set, I'm sure they won't put the Candyman on the cover because I think they had to basically come to an agreement not to use the picture too much of him or something. There was some kind of legal back and forth. It's why I think when Big Finish did a box set with him, they, they, they gave him a... He was on the box, but he, was, he had a di totally different design. Probably not to use it in promotional ways. That's amazing. Joe's pulled up a <laughs> Joe's pulled up a Google image search so that I can see, and the, one of the results is a deviant art somebody drew of them fighting. <laughs> oh God, I haven't seen that. <laughs> send, send me the link to that. I want to see that. But I, I mean, it's great. I, I personally think Doctor Who should spend more time fighting psychotic versions of corporate mascots. Uh, it's absolutely my my cup of tea. But um, I mean, they kind of somewhat did that in um, Kerblam, but then like the Doctor wound up on their side weirdly. Don't so. get me started about Kerblam. I can't. I did make a joke to someone after Kerblam that imagine like the Kerblam version if if, if Peter Matigue wrote, wrote Happiness Patrol and it was like, thank you, Doctor. We've now got our routine disappearances up forty seven percent, and we've wiped out the pipe thanks to your help. <laughs> And the thing about the Candyman looking like Bertie Bassett, that was not the original in intention for the character. He was just supposed to look like a guy. It's like I think he was supposed to be in a white suit and had like a monocle or something. But he was just supposed to look like a guy. So at what point did they make the decision to make a crazy candy robot? Uh, I think it was the production team who was like, man, let's do something interesting with this. Let's just make him a big candy man. Literally. Like, I think he was supposed... He was, he was supposed called to the candy man and they were like, oh no. Well, I mean, you're he's getting supposed a candy to, man. I think he's supposed to be made of candy stuff. Like, inside of him. But he looks human, but he's made of candy. God bless you, production team. What a good choice. <laughs> He is one of my favorite monsters in all of Who. He's just... They definitely made the right wrong call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think in the novelization, he's described not looking like this, so... That's why you don't read the novelization. No, this is 100% correct. <laughs> but he makes sweets. That's what the Candyman does. There's something very good <laughs> about this character, like, menacingly making candy. <laughs> and he has the most, like... Ridiculous voice. It's. Uh, I mean, he has the voice of a of a corporate mascot. He does. It's very high pitched. To the best of my knowledge, he's the only Doctor Who monster to ever answer the phone with his own name. Uh, the thing, the the way that that voice is done, it's a trick that was done a lot in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, radio series as well, with the various voices like the Vogons and things like that. Is what you do is you take the 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 audio input into a pitch shifter. Which shifts it shifts it down a little bit, and then you feed it back into itself so that it pitches that down and pitches that down, and like layers these, so you get this falling or rising echo. Uh, it's it's a really weird effect, but there's something about these Brits just loving that effect in their science fiction. Because like if you listen to like Marvin in the radio series of the Hitchhiker's Guide, the TV series as well, is like that's that effect, but it's falling, and here it's that effect but rising, so it's pitching it up and feeding into itself as opposed to pitching it down and feeding into itself while watching the episode and uh we were listening on our headphones you can also slightly hear sylvester mccoy Get getting, up getting on it. picked up by it as well in a couple scenes 
just very slightly. That's probably because of the microphones that he used. Yeah, I assume. Um, but what they're doing right now, what the Candyman is up to, is he's setting up an execution. Fondant surprise. That's not fondant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not? No. I don't know what fondant is. I mean, I could be wrong, but I think fondant's like the stiff stuff that you use to cover like wedding cakes. And it's not liquidy. It's like a Play-Doh almost. It is if you melt it, problem. <laughs> Maybe the surprise is that it isn't fondant. <laughs> <laughs> that would be surprising. But uh, they basically put a tube over a man and then just, just squirt sweet goo on him. And he Gross. he dies. Uh, like... Icing, not fondant. I'm just saying. Icing. I mean, fondant is icing, technically, but... True. Joseph C. uh, does the execution, and the guy falls out dead, and he, like, tastes some of it. And I think he's like, mmm, strawberry. Very gross, very goopy. I love this, like, mix of, like, you know, candy land and bright colors and happiness, and it's the most dystopian, fucked up stuff. That's very good. I think that's kind of realistic, because, like, you can't really sell a dystopia on like grays you kind of have to make it look inviting in order for people to go along with it for long enough to get stuck in it aesthetics is a huge part of fascism yeah like i feel like i've seen so many dystopian things that are like like no one is allowed to have emotions like at all you must be bland and like uh equilibriums like that and stuff you're not allowed to experience happiness really and like this is a, one of the first ones i've ever seen that it's like the opposite of that it's like you can only experience happiness and nothing else yeah i think that's what they usually get wrong <laughs> And this one kind of got it right. I was going to say, when I watched Equilibrium, I didn't experience happiness. But um, <laughs> no, you're right. It's absolutely correct. This, is, this gets it right. And, it's, and it is. I always say happiness portrayals become, seems more realistic the longer I'm alive. <laughs> Particularly no. in like a post-Trump world. There's very much that desire. It's not enough for people of a certain political persuasion just to be in charge. They want to control how people feel. That's what I've come to realize. You know, all this bullshit. Sorry, you don't swear on this. Um, all this Gordon Bennett rubbish. Oh, we do oh, we, swear. We swear a lot. Oh, okay. I, I always have you. Oh, I've, I've, I've always been really careful when I've come on here because I thought you don't swear for some reason. Basically, all, all the bullshit we talk about the culture war and stuff, that's just another way of control, trying to control how people feel. You know, like we get it a lot in this country, you know, particularly after Brexit, a lot of don't talk Britain down. If you talk Britain down, bad things will happen kind of thing and it's just oh do i get the more i look at happiness patron i'm like this isn't unrealistic this is this is very close to my lived reality if they start making people out of candy that's when we gotta be really worried <laughs> i think that's on the the list of the points of fascism yeah <laughs> candroids <laughs> Ah, uh, so they kill this guy, and then um, they also kill Harold through the slot machine. He is electrocuted, uh, and this makes Ace very angry, and she's ready to fight. I the... love her so much. God, I love Ace. And then the doctor is like basically stopping her, and he's like, "Don't, not yet." And he's, she's like, "But I want to make them pay," and he's like, "Don't worry, we will." And this I'm is like, "Oh my God, they are so dangerous." Energy. I love it. They're terrifying. They're my favorite TARDIS team. It's because of things like this, I think. Uh, but also, what's interesting is uh, Priscilla P, you know, Ace gets angry because she's making these really tasteless jokes. But you think about like three years ago in terms of Dot 2, the sixth Doctor was making jokes like that when people were killed. So. Yeah, because she says something like, uh, yeah, there's like a buzzing joke and uh, there was a real shock. You got a shock out of that. Yeah. But yeah, I now think of that scene where the sixth Doctor pushes the. Well, doesn't. Push. He doesn't push. Yeah. It, it's iffy when those people fall in that vat of acid or whatever and he's very casual about it. Excuse me if I don't join you or something like that. <laughs> Very quippy and very off-putting. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, I love them so much. They just, they seem dangerous and that is good. <laughs> then we, speaking of dangerous things, we get uh, Helen uh, goes to feed her pet, which is this weird just little... Just a good puppet. Just a good, good puppet. Yeah, it's a weird little werewolf looking puppy. Uh, named Fifi. Uh, I love this thing so much. It's, it's good craftsmanship. I'd pet that thing. And then the Doctor and Ace are still in the waiting zone and trying to figure out how to go get away. They talk. Uh, Priscilla, you said Priscilla P? I think 
I think it's Priscilla P in the waiting zone. Yeah, she's the she's the the guard basically. They talk to her about it. This go kart that's nearby. Like we can we we can just go on this go kart. Not, there's nothing that again. This is the this is the less cool go kart. Yes, this is the less cool go kart. And... It's also incredibly slow. Very slow. I feel like you could walk faster than it. But he's like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to like blow up if we try to use it. And she's like, no, no, no. Everything's fine. And then he goes over to Ace and is like, it's definitely booby trapped. But they, they do diffuse the booby trap on the go-kart. Well, the doctor does. And Ace really wants to help out. And wants to do it. But the doctor won't let her. And she is very annoyed but by Ace it. Ace is like, explosions are literally my whole thing. <laughs> Why? Never let me have any fun. <laughs> It's adorable. I love their dynamic so much. But uh, they do defuse it, and then they go two miles an hour down a hallway. <laughs> you know, it's a very aesthetically designed hallway. Yeah, the sets look really cool. It, this episode does remind me a lot of, uh, visually and aesthetically, it reminds me a lot of... Paradise Towers? Paradise Towers, thank you, yeah. But, uh, well, again, something else I love about this era of Doctor Who is... Because going into this now, as a fan, even before I'd seen this story, I knew kind of what to expect. But imagine you, you've watched Remembrance of the Daleks, and then the next week you get this. And it's, aesthetically, it's so at the other end of the scale. I love that. That's what I love about Doctor Who in general. Just the, the wild swings you can get. It's not beholden to anything, really. It can be whatever it needs to be. Uh, then we see a scene of a man playing uh, the blues on a harmonica. His name, we'll learn, is Earl. And he is being watched by something in the sewers. Uh, basically, what we'll learn about the, the, the people in the sewers is they're just a bunch of um, of uh, splinters from TMNT. <laughs> yep. They have a very harsh uh, vocal processor thing going on. I can't understand half of what they say. I've watched this story on and off for 20 years and I still have struggle. I should just put the subtitles on. I really should, but it gets it gets to the point. I don't I don't want to. As you're saying, I kind of feel the point people are the weakest part of the story. Like they're just kind of there and it adds a weird kind of accidental thing about colonialism that the the, because it's their planet and everyone else has turned up on it but they it's never addressed in the story right okay you could cut them out very easily and you wouldn't lose much thematically and you also you wouldn't have me going what what (laughs) whenever they speak (laughs) (laughs) never mind the sea devils when are they coming back but uh the go-kart breaks down and they're like, oh no, how will we get away? It's not like we could walk faster than this. And the doctor gets to work fixing it and Ace sort of wanders off and is immediately arrested and taken to auditions uh, for, the, I guess, for the Happiness Patrol where she meets her girl, <coughs> uh, she meets Susan Q. <laughs> this is a good scene! Uh, and the, I don't, they, they just flirt a lot in this scene. She is the first official Ace's girlfriend. Well, maybe male counts in Dragonfire, to be fair, but this is like the first, I always feel like this is the first like time you look at Ace and go, oh, maybe, maybe you're not that heterosexual. I mean, Tony realized it immediately. I mean, <laughs> did you see the jacket? <laughs> Fair point. But they have a whole uh, little scene where they just, just, I don't even remember what they're talking about, but it's heavily flirtatious, I feel like. Um, I mean, what they're talking about is that, what, what was her name? The Susan Q, or Susan? Susie Q. Isn't Susie Q a song by Creedence Clearwater Revival? Yes, it is. And also, it was uh, there was a film called Susie Q that was about a ghost girl played by the Pink Power Ranger. It's a Disney Channel original movie. <laughs> she doesn't want to be on the Happiness Patrol anymore. Yeah. Like, she is aware that it's bullshit. And she doesn't want Ace to die. It's really interesting for me that that scene actually with her because you're right. She's she's been part of the system. She's been part of the Happiness Patrol. So she's very you know she's probably being complicit in routine disappearances. It's never stated, but you can you can infer that. And then she's like, I am broken by this system, and I'm going to let you escape, even though it will mean my death. I find that really interesting. I think it's a very bleak seem beautifully kind of it's never overly stated but it's kind of suicide almost in a way yeah it's it's implied because that's what she does she's like i'm gonna give you a key and then i'm gonna close my eyes and whatever happens happens so ace escapes it's a very good scene it's one of those things where i'm like oh i'm immediately paying attention now (laughs) the doctor gets the go-kart up and going again and but then it breaks down again and he meets Silas P, who uh, tries to trick him and do, does the little card thing again. And it's every time he hands him the card, do they read the Silas P side first? 
I think he hands it to them that way specifically. Yeah, that makes sense. But if I get handed a card, I generally like flip it around to the back because that's where all the important information is. <laughs> You're like, I know how a business card works. This scene would not work on me. I think he maybe hands it to people assuming they're going to do that, but then when they don't, he has to tell them to flip it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this isn't a bit he's doing. This is something that keeps happening to him. God damn it. Yeah, don't. Why don't they ever <laughs> flip it? I just... <laughs> Um, but before, like, he does flip it, and before he can whistle, that's what it is, he has a whistle, uh, before he can whistle for the happiness patrol, the blues harmonica player guy knocks him over the head and, uh, saves the doctor. They leave, and then the happiness patrol shows up, and Silas P is upset that he didn't get the doctor, and they're like, you're upset, and then they kill him, because he's not happy. Then we get, uh, some more of the Candyman, and a new character named Gilbert. I don't remember his letter, but they're just a bickering couple, basically, because like he shows up and the Candyman's like, "What hour do you think this is?" Oh, it's brilliant that line. I I, I love it because it is. There's no other Doctor Who monster that gets to say stuff like that in the classic series. It's very good. Well, to bring it back to Ninja Turtles references, their dynamic is a little bit Shredder and Krang in the eighty eighty seven series. Uh, but they they bicker a bit. The Doctor and Earl are sneaking around in this this candy kitchen but they are caught by the candy man and gilbert and uh but that's that's the uh cliffhanger is they're caught by the candy man at the end of episode one which uh, again i called a dew sprinkled sunrise and episode two which i we're now in the episode two which i've called a psy wrap rainbow i see what you're doing you see what i'm doing i see what you're doing i don't care for it but i see it <laughs> So uh, Ace sees a march, uh, a protest march, and is taken to a, uh, captured again and taken to another waiting zone. Um, Ace keeps just getting arrested. <laughs> it's a grand Doctor Who tradition. I was going to say, to be fair, that is what the doctor said the plan was. She take, she took it to heart. Uh, the, the, the march, the protest march, uh, they have like, what's the, what's the big banner they have? I thought it was very clever and now I can't remember what it says. You didn't put it in your notes? I, I know. I'm bad at taking notes. It's uh, factor crumple conditions are a joke. I'm guessing factory? That's it. That's the sign I like. So the candy man straps the doctor and Earl down and uh, just talks about what he does, and uh, which is that he makes sweets that kill people. The doctor questions the candy man about the executions. And like he just gives up a lot of information very easily. Then the dumbest thing happens. <laughs> Perhaps the stupidest thing in this episode, but I don't mind because it's ridiculous and wonderful. He, the doctor tricks the candy man into turning around and knocking some stuff to the floor. And it's lemonade. He knocks lemonade to the floor. He gets stuck to the floor because he's made of candy. And then the doctor and Earl escape. Yeah, and he does like a a, a, a science-y explanation for how that happened. As if you need much more than... It's candy. <laughs> it's wet. It's stuck. <laughs> but I, I kind of, I kind of love the fact that they do acknowledge the impracticalities of making a robot from candy, which is lemonade, can stick it to the floor. You know, the, the, there's no kind of like they don't try and like pass it over and go, no, it's it's a special sweet substance. It's like, no, he's he's made of candy. Lemonade's going to stick him to the floor. Why was there just lemonade like right on the edge of that table? It's a very convenient setup. Cause it's. Oh, they're making candy. I feel like this would be happening all the time if you just left your lemonade right there on the counter, right next to the edge. I knock stuff off all the time. Why? Cause I'm clumsy. It's it's don't it's, do that. It's a little convenient, but it's fine. Um, the doctor and Earl escape through a pipe, uh, a syrup pipe, and the doctor sets up a Chekhov's gun and says not to make certain sounds. He's not so much concerned about the loudness as much as, I guess, the pitch, the, the, the specific note that is made, because we'll learn out what happens later if you make the right noise. The Candyman asks Gilbert to help unstick him, and Gilbert doesn't. He just takes this time to, be, to put the Candyman in his place. And says they have symbiosis. You need me and I need me. Uh, which I think is a very good line. And it seems like a, a little bit of a one-sided symbiosis there. <laughs> a little bit. So he just doesn't unstick him because he's like, I'm going to show you who's boss. The sewer people, the, the little rat guys, find the doctor and Earl. Earl plays his harmonica for them. And they think it is, quote, 
wicked. And because they say the word wicked, the doctor's like, oh, they've seen Ace. <laughs> and then when they're talking about, oh, you've met my friend Ace, they're like, we don't know an Ace. We know Gordon Bennett. At some point, I don't know if this has happened yet, but at some point, Earl was his name, said uh, it can only be the work of a schizophrenic obsessive, uh, which seems like a bit of an armchair diagnosis. Like, I, I feel like there's mm, maybe a little bit of assumption going on there and possibly a bit uh, problematic. Schizophrenic obsessive is not uh, does not equate to a, a murderer. It's not really what that what that diagnosis means. It's a bit of a stigmatizing nonsense there. Plus, well, as the 80s. We, we were not as progressive with our mental health stuff back in the 80s. Still aren't, really. That's true. But uh, Susan is taken away, I guess, to take him back to the auditions. I'm not quite sure. They're going to take Ace, but Ace is saved by one of the sewer people. One of the Master Splinters. I think their name is Wolfric and Wences, which they say, like, one time in episode three. God, do they have names? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, the doctor calls them Wolfric and Winces. 20 years of watching this, and I've never realized they have names. <laughs> I'm a bad fan. I do, I do a goddamn podcast about this era, and I've never realized they have names. Oh, I'm going to have to in my badge. Eric's going to have to get a new co-host. <laughs> <laughs> Are there names in the credits? I don't think so. I think the doctor just calls them that. Again, in episode three. Wences and Wolfric are in the credits. But I don't think they get name dropped until episode three. Like, with dialogue. So they, the Doctor and Earl uh, leave the sewers. They bump into Trevor again. And Earl just leaves. He's like, bye, I'll see you later. And uh, starts playing his harmonica. Trevor is like, ooh, I like that. It makes me feel melancholy. Then something that happens twice in this serial... Helen, for the first time, uh, sends Fifi into the pipes to take care of the sewer people. And I guess the doctor and stuff. Or maybe Ace. I don't know. She just wants to take out her problems that are in the sewer with uh, her dog. And then we see the march again. Some snipers set up on a rooftop nearby the uh, protest march. And there are two guys who start discussing uh, gender. They're like... Women get all the good jobs and we get the, the grunt work. I thought they were complaining about the guns specifically. <laughs> they, they are complaining about the guns specifically. The doctor sort of like, you know, talks around Trevor into making Trevor feel like the doctor uh, is somewhat above him <laughs> and gets him to take him to Helena. And they go there and discuss population control. She had been told to implement some programs or whatever to get the population under control. And she didn't do that. She just, um, she did her own thing, which was, you know, killing oh, yeah, a bunch of people. Candy. I love the moment where Joseph C. goes, no more queues at the post office. In Britain, that's a real Daily Mail right-winger moan that the, the queues are too long at the post office. And it's just a wonderful term to use for what is not genocide, but mass murder of your population. To go, yeah, but, you know, no more queues at the post office. It, it feels like a Daily Mail headline. Spin is one thing to call that. It's kind of like right now for me, there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of people complaining about like how no one wants to work in fast food anymore. And it's a combination of people not wanting to work for such low wages. But also, I feel like there's a lot of people who died from the pandemic. There's a lot less people to do the job. Similar sort of situation, I feel like. People complaining about the wrong thing. Yeah, they should just raise the wages and uh, increase the safety protocols. Exactly. While they do this, Helen leaves to go to her office to do something. And the doctor just starts poking around and finds Helen's photo album. And the only thing in the photo album is pictures of her and Fifi. Do you think Fifi is Fifi B? I, yeah, I was just thinking that, actually. I did give going on what I said earlier. You're right. I think Fifi is Fifi B, no doubt. There's no pictures of her husband. It's just her and the dog. But the doctor does sneak into Helen's office as she's, you know, being overtly evil and setting up executions. And he confronts her about these executions. And she tries to call her guards, but they're not coming very fast. I don't know if he did something to uh, fuss with that. But he leaves and takes an extinguisher and a bottle of lemonade with him that he will utilize later. Meanwhile, in the sewers, uh, Ace throws Nitro-9 at Fifi, and I assumed it killed the dog. I was wrong. Fifi's fine. I was very upset, though. I was like, no! Not the not the pupper! And now this dog is evil, but it's still a puppy! 
Um, so the doctor runs out with the, the extinguisher and the lemonade and finds Earl. Earl tells the doctor about the protest march and also that there are snipers set up nearby. So the doctor goes to take care of that in a scene that is amazing. <laughs> the doctor just is so intimidating that they put their guns down. Yeah, that scene is good. I like that scene. Yeah, it, 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 what's great about it is he, you know, he doesn't shout or anything at them. He just, he's just so intense. He doesn't even threaten them. He just talks them out of it. And he just basically says, you don't want to do that. Just do it. Actually, he tries to talk them into it because he's, he's basically goading them. He's saying, yeah, shoot me. I'm standing right here. Well, I think that is part of the, the like subtext of that scene is like they're snipers. So he's like, I've killed people a bunch. But and he's like, I've never, never done out. it up close. And he's like, yeah, because you can't. <laughs> Like, look into my very much alive eyes looking at you. And kill me. And the guy's like, right, no, that's yucky. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a good scene. It's so good. Yeah, he's faced with the reality of what he's doing. The original plan for it was that Doctor was going to basically use some kind of hypnosis. And this is so much better than that. Yeah. Because it's just false personality. They always makes me laugh that he, he takes the sniper rifle and he chucks it off the balcony. And I always imagine there's some poor guy underneath who just gets squashed by the um, sniper <laughs> rifle as he chucks it off. Like, just some like... ch or some children come by and they're like, ooh, a toy. <laughs> They're about to execute Susan. They set her up under the pipe. And Ace and the sewer people are in the pipe where the goop starts coming out and they have to run away from it. But the doctor goes to the candy kitchen and offers to free the candy man in exchange for him stopping the fondant surprise that's going to kill Susan. It occurs to me that the reason why it's Susan Q and not Susie Q is specifically no nicknames. Oh, good point. But he does. He frees the, the Candyman with the fire extinguisher thing. And then he goes and stops the fondant surprise. And just a little bit of goop comes out. Uh, as uh, Ace, when they were running away from the group, Ace popped out where the execution was. And she's like holding on to Susan as the uh, fondant surprise is about to drop. And it's just, just a little trickle comes out. And then uh, they run off. Or maybe they get caught. I don't remember. <laughs> and then uh, Helen's watching this and like, ugh. We're going to have to do that execution again. And Trevor is like, actually, you can't. That's double jeopardy, baby. You can't do the same execution on the same person twice. That's just the law, apparently. Yeah. If it doesn't work the first time, you got to do something different. He does say an alternate execution will be fine. You just can't do the fondant surprise again. Not because that's fucked up and weird. Just because you can't do it again. Anyway, the candy man's like, so doctor, our deal is up. We're good. Uh, you let me go. I stopped the fondant surprise. But now that our deal is over, I'm going to kill you. So the doctor just puts more lemonade on him and sticks him <laughs> to the floor again. <laughs> I like how like... Fucking useless <laughs> this guy is. Yeah, episode one sets him up as so terrifying and weird. And then episode two, 95% of it, he's stuck to the floor. <laughs> Again, I feel that that's become more realistic as as we see various people, you know, like various, say, Trump allies who are, are kind of dangerous, but also shockingly incompetent at the same time. And I kind of like that the same problem is solved the exact same way twice, just because it can be solved the same way twice. Right. Which is like, in writing, it's so common to like, oh, we have this problem, we solve it, and now next time it happens, you got to think of a new, clever solution to it. But it's like, you already have a solution, you already did it once, and the lemonade's right there. Just do it again. But you can't do fondant surprise twice. I think it's specifically in reference to that. I think that is a, a clever juxtaposition of like, well, if you can't do things twice, well, we can. So fuck off. Huh. I never thought of that. That's a good point. Helen tells Ace and Susan that they are going to have to audition on the late show at the forum, which is a different, basically a different form of execution. Then we cut to the, the Earl playing his harmonica and the doctor playing spoons as people throw money in a hat for him. <laughs> There was an earlier point. I don't know if anybody pointed this out and I blanked uh, out, but um, there was a point where where Ace was playing the spoons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That happened when she was uh, like auditioning for the Happiness Patrol, I think. 
She played spoons. Yeah. Well, they're trying to figure out what her talents are or whatever, and she does spoons, but they're like, that's not good. And then she's <laughs> that's like, that's not a talent. Can you sing? And she's like, I know this really good song. It's really sad. And they're like, well, I can't do that. In this scene, it's the it's the doctor and that's the on the DVD that the performance of Earl and the doctor playing like the doctor playing spoons and Earl playing his harmonica is a bit longer. It seems odd to me that the, there's like all of this stuff going on and they just take a moment to, to do a little street performance. I think when we were watching, when we were watching this, I think it was Christine who said that the doctor just kind of wanders in and out of the plot and is not beholden to it in any way, in a way that makes him seem like extremely powerful. <laughs> Yeah, he like had, his ability to not give a damn or be affected by anything. There is a certain aura about him, a mysteriousness to specifically this doctor, I feel like, that's different than we've seen before. There's just a little weirdness about him. But they do a little performance and uh, they see some posters being put up for the late show. And Ace is on one of them. The doctor asks like the ticket guy, like, when's when's the show? And he's like, in five minutes. And he's like, what? Well, why are the posters just now being put up? And they're like, yeah, that's just, you know, we have to do that. But every everybody shows up. It's com like they have to show up. It's compulsory. So the doctor sends Earl to go to the pro to get the protesters. He's like, get the protesters, bring them to this show thing. I got a plan in, in mind. And then uh, the poster next to Aces with a different person on it, someone paints the letters R.I.P. on it. In pink. Uh-oh. Things could be bad for Ace. That is the cliffhanger. That is the end of episode two. And we are now into episode three, which I have called A Dream Dipped Tomorrow. I don't know if y'all... If y do, you, do you know what I'm doing? I know what you're doing. Do, do y'all know what I'm doing? No. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, it's the lyrics to, uh, the Candyman can. Ah, oh, of course. I see. It be, you could have just called these three episodes Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. <laughs> that would have been dangerous. And I think you just, uh, brought some trouble on yourself. Imagine if you just there hear this thumping or screaming that I just don't respond for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> What if you'd said Candyman, 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 and instead of getting... Why? <laughs> I, isn't it you have to say it five times? I think it's three times in a mirror? I haven't actually seen it. I haven't seen it either. Does it require a mirror? I saw a trailer for the new one. In the original, it does require a mirror. I can't remember if it's three or five times. It's a great film, by the way, the original. Really, really good. But yeah, I think... I'm look, looking in the mirror, so I'm safe. There we go. I'm looking at my uh, image. I'm recording the video for this in OBS. So does that count as a mirror? Uh, maybe? <laughs> it is five times. It's a bit like the question, if you uploaded the VHS video from The Ring onto YouTube, would that count to showing it to somebody else? You know, These are the like weird loopholes you have to think through. The analog purists would definitely have a, a couple of things to say against the uploading to YouTube thing. Because once it's digital, it's, it's not real. Tarantino would have a problem with it. What if you said Candyman however many times you're supposed to say it, uh, and instead of, you know, the murderous guy with the, I don't know, what he has a hook for a hand or something, right? I don't remember. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Yeah, hook, hook for hand. But if if instead of the, the, the horror movie Candyman, you got the Doctor Who Candyman, would that be less terrifying or more terrifying? It depends on if you have, you have lemonade, lemonade or not. Yeah. Maybe you just get a phone call and you pick it up and the other voice at the end goes, Candyman? <laughs> I don't think it needs to be lemonade. I think you can just as well use like a, a Coke, for example. Or uh, he doesn't show up, but the Bertie Bassett people show up and say, please, please cut it out. You get a letter from the lawyers, cease and desist. Um, so anyway, episode three, the final episode, which uh, can I say it's nice to have like a three parter. The pace is so much better. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got this one and not one of the, the 25 parters. Oh, yeah, those classic Doctor Who 25 parters. Yeah. The doctor is still talking to the ticket guy and uh, asks if Ace is on the list. And he's t also telling what the talents are that they're doing or whatever for this thing. And he's like, is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And uh, the doctor's like, could be magic. She is good at making things disappear. Because she blows stuff up. But she's not on it for magic. She's on it for miracle survival. And uh, the doctor figures that the trick to that is it'd be a miracle if you can survive. So he's got to go rescue her. So then we see that uh, Fifi is damaged by the Nitro 9, but is not dead because uh, Helen bandages Fifi up and is going to release Fifi into the pipes again. This is the only part of the, the serial that like 
I felt was like a little repetitive. Like we get this, it's basically the same thing both times is that like Helen puts Fifi into the pipes and then Fifi gets hurt. It happens twice and not in an interesting way like the, the lemonade on the candy man. The weakest part of this series, the serial is in the pipes. <laughs> I'm just going to keep the Ninja Turtles references going and say that Fifi looks like something out of Next Mutation. Which is your your favorite version of the Ninja <laughs> Turtles, right? Yep, Fan absolute favorite, top, Next top Mutation. favorite. Everybody loves it. I mean, the, the the puppetry is decent for the budget on that show, uh, which can be said here as well. And I think it's similar. If you got to say something nice, sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not like movie level puppetry, but like for like a Fox Kids live action show, I'd say the puppetry on that show is pretty good. Uh, Doctor is waiting outside the forum for Earl and the protesters to show up. And Trevor shows up and says that he's finished his census. He shows the doctor a list that's basically like, these are all the people that aren't here anymore. Uh, people that have disappeared. And he flings it out. And it's very, very long. But he's got to leave because he's got to do a census somewhere else on Earth. But uh, while the doctor is waiting, he gets up and there's just like a microphone. Uh, and he goes and he sings a song. There's just a lot of the doctor just, just performing. He sings as time goes by and as he's singing it, Earl walks up and joins him on harmonica. And then uh, the protesters show up and they all start celebrating. They're having a, a very happy time. And the happiness patrol show up with Susan and Ace. The doctor basically uses their own logic against them and says, we're all having, we're all being happy. You're the ones being unhappy. And then the patrol sort of turns on each other. Because like one, like one half of the patrol is like, you're right, they're not being happy. And like points their gun at the other half of the patrol. And I it's, love this. It's very good. And you can't, you can't attack the protesters either because we're all having a good time. It's gloriously Seventh Doctor. It's very much using the rules of the system against them. But I also like the idea that half the happiness patrol are such genuine fanatics that they'll just follow it. They won't think outside of the, uh, the rules. And then the doctor steals their cool go-kart, the, the big doom buggy one. <laughs> Helen A. hears, over here, hears like an announcement that like things are going badly. So she leaves Joseph to retrieve Fifi and she's going to go deal with the happiness patrol that, the, the, because they're fighting each other. And then uh, she goes and broadcasts onto uh, the slots machine because the happiness patrol is now in the waiting zone. Uh, and she appears on the slots machine and is basically like, hey, cut it out. And then everyone goes into the sewers and there's a bit of a chase scene where they keep being chased by Fifi. And this is the point where the sewer sound thing pays off because the doctor just starts having Earl play different notes on his harmonica to, I don't know, reverb Find the resonant frequency with the crystals that are hanging, the syrup crystals that are hanging in the pipe. And when he plays a note, Fifi will, will howl the same note at the same time, which causes it to resonate even more. And they fall on top of Fifi. So again, it's another scene of Fifi goes into the pipes, chasing people, and then gets hurt. But this time, it's much more deadly. So things are going really bad. Uh, factories are being destroyed. I mean, going back for Helen A. She's like, I want, all right, we need someone to take charge of this. Someone who's like really, you know, into this whole happiness patrol thing. So she's like... Priscilla P is very gung ho about this, and she turns on a, a video to see where Priscilla P is at, and she has been incapacitated by Ace and Earl. So like she keeps trying to do these things, and then like stuff keeps popping up that like she's already been bested, basically. I think it, it works so well because there's what they do. They don't when the doctor turns up. It's never the sense that this is a this is a dictatorship that's that's working really well. It's obviously a system that's kind of already falling apart. So all he really has to do is just give it a good kick and then the whole thing you know crumbles rather than it's like it's like he, he does the impossible or something it's very much like he's just there just to to provide an example and then they run off and um destroy what was it a thousand factories or whatever uh I, there's also a bit where like they're just taking out the speakers and they're like oh listen to that quiet or whatever and the doctor's like i don't know i can hear the toppling of governments <laughs> is very good but because uh priscilla p has been captured by ace and earl she calls the candy man and the candy man's like don't worry about it i'm already on it because uh, i'm pretty sure the doctor and ace are in here with me and he threatens them and they're threatening him and he says some glorious line about i'm going to show you the back of my candy hands <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, they use a hot poker on him and uh, they open an oven and some flames fly out of the oven and uh, they basically force the Candyman to run away into the pipes. It, it also has that other great moment where um, he has to flick a coin to decide which of them he's going to kill and the Doctor go, go, he hesitates and the Doctor goes, what is it? And he goes, that would be telling and then immediately turns to Ace to kill her. <laughs> ah, it's very good. But while he's ro- running through the pipes, the sewer people have are fussing with uh, the fondant flow and they redirect it so that it runs over the candy man and then just a disintegrated candy man pops out of the pipes. They reversed the polarity of the fondant flow. <laughs> But that's a truly disgusting, horrible visual. I love it. Of just the bones of the candy man sliding out of that pipe. That probably been worse. I don't know if that had been worse or better if it had been just a guy. A guy. Yeah. And then there's a, just a, a scene where we get the candy man's entire origins told to us by Gilbert. It's like Gilbert and Joseph stand over his body and they're like, just discuss how he came about. He was just an experiment gone wrong. And Gilbert and Joseph sort of bond over this. <laughs> It's a very bizarre scene. I love it. And then Helen is like, things are going bad. I'm going to leave. I'm going to prepare a shuttle to leave. But then when she does, it's like, the shuttle has already left. And she's like, what? And she turns on a video and Gilbert and Joseph have just run off without her. Yet another gay subtext. I I like to call this uh, this ship uh, Gosef. It's still just Joseph, but the G is like a a J. (laughs) It's like Jeff. And then that's uh, that's pretty much everything that goes on. The Doctor Ace and Susan get you know control like they tie up the rest of the Happiness Patrol. Uh, they find where the music is being pumped out, and they broadcast Earl's harmonica music instead, his his blues music. Then the Doctor confronts Helen, like he meets her in the streets, and she's like, "I'll find another place to enact happiness and control." And uh, the Doctor mentions something about love, and she's like. Love is overrated. I, I love this scene so much. I think I, I love the fact that when he first confronts her, the, like the fir- her first justification is they didn't understand me. And there's something about that that I just think really hits at the heart of, of her. And But also, again, it's something I could imagine Trump saying. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand me. And he's, he's got no time for it. I mean, this doesn't get talked about as much as, say, the, the sniper scene, but I think it's kind of on the same level. The Doctor still got that kind of fury that quiet fury to him, which I think just works so well into her, her increasing justifications and her contempt for everyone else, the contempt for the, for the people she was supposed to be leading. I think it works really well. And the doctor starts talking about like how you, you need more than just happiness. You need sadness. They're like two sides of the same coin. Like you need a balance of all these things. And then she just like, I don't need sadness, blah, 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 or whatever. And um, she turns around and coming out of the pipes, is her dog Fifi? I think that's that's uh, when when they're talking about love because they've already talked about the sadness, and then then she's like, "I have no use for love," and that's when the dog shows up. Yeah, and then the dog dies in her arms, and she just collapses into tears. And there's a big crane shot as it pulls out of her crying, and the Doctor and Ace are there. And um, uh, I think Ace says something. Is there something we should do? And he's like, "It's done." And that's where the episode should have ended. I, I forgot that it didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's such a strong moment. I wish it had ended there. That was the plan originally, but apparently they they stuck on the next scene because John Nathan Turner felt like if because they didn't know the, the the broadcast order, and he 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 felt like if it was going to be the last episode of the series, they should ha- end on a happier note. But, I mean, I do agree with you. It's such a strong ending. You can imagine, as that crane goes up, you can just imagine the credits kicking in. I wish it had ended there. And then they paint the TARDIS. Yeah, see? And then we could have had a pink TARDIS if we'd not had this scene. <laughs> I mean, this scene is fine, I guess. It's just, it's not as impactful. If if we consider later canon, no, we would not have had a pink TARDIS because the pink paint would have peeled off as it as it left. Because we've seen that with the Clara artwork. But uh, basically what the next scene is like, the blues have returned and goodbyes are said and the Doctor and Earl do a complicated handshake that's <laughs> that makes me cringe oh yeah and and when they say that the blues have returned they the, the doctor says something about like uh 
how you need all, all the the colors, and you can, you can't have something something without the blues, and then then they're painting the guitar is blue, and it's the, those things are linked, it's symbolic. Um, though later we learned that was unnecessary. We could have just left it, and it would have went away. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe they didn't know that. But uh, that's it. That's the uh, that's the end of the happiness patrol. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we'll be back for final thoughts. It was the dawn of another podcast. The Epsilon 3 is a dream given form. It's a home away from home for three guys to watch a 90s sci-fi classic TV show. Three guys with microphones over 3,249 miles apart, all alone in the night. The year is 2021. The name of the station is Babylon 5. The name of the podcast is is the Epsilon 3. Veer, bring me a drink. And we're back. Tony, do you know what time it is? Yes, I do. What time is it? So you'd like me to tell you? Please. Okay. It is 12.46 p.m. What time is it in Sweden? It's 18.46. Hey, that's so many hours. That's 18 hours. Okay, but what time is What do we do at this point in the po- recording of the podcast? Uh, I think I take a nap. Yeah, but <laughs> what happens while you take a nap? Shh, I'm napping. But, uh, hey, shh. 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 I'm napping. How long are you napping for? So many hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, time for final thoughts. Final thoughts. This is a really, really good episode that I enjoy a lot. There's a lot of weird shit in it. And I love Ace and Seven so much. Like, so much. The just intense, quiet rage. Well, it's less quiet with Ace. (laughs) But the fact that, like, that is their dynamic. That, like, Ace is, like, openly angry and I want to smash things. And the doctor's like, shh, no. We're going to quietly smash things. We're going to fuck things up in a clever way. So don't don't worry about it. <laughs> it's a good, it's good. It's very good. And the fact that that's all happening at the same time as candy robots and bad guys with weird guns and pink hair. 10 out of 10. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Vince, what are your final thoughts? I don't feel like I have a whole lot of final thoughts. I enjoyed this serial. I think it's it's well paced. It has something to say and it says it coherently and without a lot of falling off of, of, of the message. Like it's fairly on message the whole time. Uh, it has some very good scenes like the sniper scene and the final scene and there's good scenes and it's got it's got good ideas it's got the candy man it's got this this view of fascism as this colorful inviting thing which i think is very important that i think a lot of dystopian science fiction just doesn't get right like i feel like it's so common to see everything just gray and boring and dull and everything's forbidden and you can't be you can't be happy and this this i feel was a lot more honest about what fascism does which is i mean it's obviously done in a sort of satirical exaggerated fashion but it's it's saying like no what what fascism does is it it tricks you it promises you good things and and then it takes away important things like lives <laughs> so so yeah the the i i feel like this was a very good tier i obviously you can you can see that the budget is limited the outdoors look like indoors that is, you know, unmistakably a fact about this uh, production, but that's fine because it's telling a story and we're we're following the story and it's 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 a well told story uh, in, in three parts, which is not too many parts. I think maybe it could have been two parts, but I don't think that's I don't think that's a huge difference. I think this could have been like a one episode of New Who type of length of story, but I don't think it's too bloated. Uh, I think it it makes fairly good use of its time. I do think I do agree that the the uh, the the master splinters kind of veer off a little bit into a thing that's not fully explored, and that could have been a different episode that's specifically focused on colonialism or whatever. Like, but but you know, it's still like part of the the world building, which I feel was very strong in this serial. It has very strong world building because like we're thrown into this world and immediately we know what's going on. I think I think it's I think it's a, a very good. Very good serial. I do wish that I had been keeping up with the the show enough to know this doctor and Ace 
better because uh, I feel like I'm I'm thrown in. And I'm like, okay, I get who the doctor is. I'm I'm gathering which kind of doctor this is, and it feels very familiar. It feels the doctor, but this is the, my, really my only proper exposure to this doctor. And I feel like I feel like I can I rec- I recognize this as a do- the doctor. I'm not like, oh, what? Who's this guy? I'm like, no, this is the doctor. He does things that the doctor would do in these situations. I understand this doctor. I feel like, and I feel like I understand Ace as well on a on a basic level of like, yeah, Ace is this radical kind of hot headed person who wants to to make change and do it loudly. And the doctor is kind of this this other voice of like, yes, let's make the change. But let's do it smartly. And I feel like that's an interesting dynamic. I like this serial. And I feel like I've talked too long uh, at this point. I feel like I didn't say a whole lot during the episode. I, I interjected a couple of times here and there. So I guess this is what I have to say. And I have now said it. And I shall now pass the mic to whoever's next. That'd be me. Yeah, I really like this serial. Pretty much everything you guys said. I think this this does remind me a lot of Paradise Towers a little bit because of the like specifically the sets uh, and the the bright colors and s- similar sort of vibe to it. Uh, I do think I might slightly prefer Paradise Towers, but only very slightly. I do think the Happiness Patrol is maybe more solid thematically. But I think maybe Paradise Towers is just a teeny bit more fun. Uh, and I do think this serial, Happiness Patrol, does have a, a couple of weak points, which is the sewer people, the repetition of the, the Fifi stuff. But overall, everything else is, like, amazing. Uh, the Seventh Doctor is amazing. Ace is amazing. Everything else that this serial is doing is, like, 100% great and i do enjoy that it's three episodes the pace feels a lot faster i i could see this being a new who episode and if they got rid of that sort of sewer people subplot it'd probably be you know tightened up a little bit it could be a new who episode so i just i just enjoy everything that this serial is doing and this current era of doctor who is doing it's been so good (laughs) And I keep hearing that the rest, the, from here on out, everything is also very good. So I'm just excited for what we've got left uh, in classic Doctor Who. So, uh, yeah. Adam, what's your final thoughts? I could have really come on to any episode and talked about any McCoy story and, and enthused about it. But when it comes down to Happiness Patrol, I just, bluntly, I just really fucking love it. <laughs> I think for me, I, I know Doctor Who can't be like this all the time, and I wouldn't want it to be. But something about having two anarchists who like blowing stuff up, traveling, traveling around, finding a fascist regime and just going, no, no, we're not having this. And they're just kicking it over in one night and doing it through intelligence and fury. And I just love that. I love it deeply. And I think it, it's one of those stories that over the years I've watched it, I get more out of it every time as my understanding of politics increases, as my understanding of how fascism works increases, as I understand how people use and abuse power you know that the sewer boys have names i know the sewer boys have names like this is still a, a shocking revelation for me <laughs> I, I don't know if it's something i did know and i've forgotten about but i'm gonna have to have some deep meditation thoughts on the fact that i wasn't as aware of this as i probably should have been but no i just it, it's something i don't think any other series could really do this story like it's not impossible to imagine an a star trek the original series doing something about a a planet where everyone has to be happy but it wouldn't it wouldn't be done with the same kind of anarchic fury that the dot two can do it's not the mccoy episode i would recommend to people if they want to get into classic who i always actually recommend survival which you guys won't be getting to for a while but i do always kind of wonder out of this whole series 25 this is the one i always really want to recommend to people i know you're supposed to recommend remembrance of the daleks and remembrance of the daleks is fantastic and I kind of understand if you're trying to go to someone, hey, look, Dot isn't Dot Who brilliant, you maybe want to go for the thing that isn't obviously set in a studio. <laughs> but I just it's just it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant and it's funny and it's angry and I I love it dearly. Alright, so that's uh the happiness patrol. Before uh we go, uh is there anything uh y'all need to plug? Uh Vince, what do you gotta plug? Well, I have so little going on right now, but at some point I might release some new music. <laughs> Didn't you just release a new song? I mean, it's in Swedish. Yeah, it's in Swedish. So I don't think anyone's interested. <laughs> I have some of your Swedish songs on my iPod. But I, I've I've got some stuff lined up in English that I just need to record at a time when I'm not having acid reflux. <laughs> 
So that's coming at some point. And where can people find that music? VincentDL.bandcamp.com, I believe. Yep, I can I can confirm. We say it every episode. We actually also say SoundCloud.com slash VincentDL. Is there one you have a prefer- preference for, or? Uh, well, generally Bandcamp is the one where where I tend to send people because people can actually buy some of my tracks there. And also, uh, there's. I don't think there's a, an upload limit for how many things I can put on there, which is different from SoundCloud, which you have to pay for to, to upload more than a certain amount of stuff. That sucks. Yeah, go to Bandcamp. Adam, how about you? Anything you need to plug? I have a couple of podcasts. There's The Real McCoy, which is uh, my seventh Doctor podcast that I do with Eric. We're now looking at a selection of the new adventures. You can find us on Twitter at real underscore pod. And also there are plans for Harry Sullivan is an imbecile to make a comeback this year, which I do with uh, Brian, friend friend of this show, uh, Brian Snape. So uh, if you follow us on Twitter at Imbecile Pod, uh, we should hopefully have an uh, episode out in the next couple of months. It's exciting. Fantastic. Do we have anything we need to plug? Um, I don't have anything. Do you have anything? Not really. Listen to the Watchathon of Rassilon. <laughs> Please keep listening to our podcast. Thank you. Um, if you liked uh, this episode of the podcast, you can check out more on WatchYourAssLine.com. You can also find our podcast, our Patreon, our Amazon wish list, and more at Linktree slash Watchathon. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Watchathon. And special thanks again to Bisexual Brigadier for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks, Bisexual Brigadier. Check them out on Tumblr at bisexualbrigadier.tumblr.com. Uh, special thanks again to Bill Lamond for becoming a Patreon patron. Thank you, Bill. Uh, his Twitter is past shelf date JR. And um, special thanks to Vince and EL for providing us with our theme song. Hey, thanks, Vince. <laughs> uh, you, you're well welcome. And uh, tune in next time when we talk about Silver Nemesis with Ashley Rayburn and Mike Gordon. Ooh, I, be fun. I assume it's about uh you know that the classic Doctor Who villains uh those guys with the arms what Chumblies how about the Chumblies it's the Chumblies right the Chumblies don't have the arms the Porks have the Porks arms. have the arms yeah the Chumblies look like upturned punch bowls I think it might be about a Picard clone I think it's about all three that's what it's going to be about but uh until next time keep calm and wrestle on. Goodbye, and I love you in a platonic, parasocial way. Have a tasteful tuna. Bye. Impolite guests get to feel the back of my candy hand. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network. Your station for all things geek.